Hello, everyone. This is Rabbi Marcus Rubenstein, again, being back, uh, being able to be with you here in this wonderful format of, of Jewish mysticism and thought. It's just uh, been incredible so far to be able to share this wisdom that I love so much, and I hope you're enjoying the journey. We'll continue again today with learning another pearl from the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, we, he really is quite fantastic in the wisdom uh, that the Baal Shem Tov is giving us, opening up new portals and new windows in really how to serve God and how to live in a spiritual life as a Jewish person, as, as a human being in general. This will be actually our last uh, virtual class, last podcast on the Baal Shem Tov, at least for this period. Uh, in, in a couple days, we'll switch to uh, actually Rab, uh, Rabbi Abraham Yitzchak, a Cohen Cook, and we'll switch to his uh, some of his spiritual writings, which I think is going to be really amazing, and we'll do his thought for a period. My plan is basically to keep switching around and doing a, a small period on uh, one a spiritual rabbi, one Jewish thinker, and then switch to another Jewish thinker and try to really unearth the pearls and the deep wisdom from each of these spiritual masters in our tradition. Um, so I'm just so glad you're here with me on this journey. Today we're going to look at the Beisht again, Baal Shem Tov, and we're going to specifically look at him in terms of how to deal with negative thoughts, negativity, um, how to deal with sorrow, how to deal with pain, uh, and obviously this is not a simple topic, and there's not one answer of, of how to deal with all pain, right? Uh, certainly, uh, I don't think the Baal Shem Tov is saying that, um, but this is a strategy that works a lot of the time, and it has to do deeply with the theology of the Baal Shem Tov. So on one hand, we're going to look at how to deal with sorrow, how to deal with pain in the spiritual life, but also we're going to look at the theology of the Baal Shem Tov in general and how the Baal Shem Tov looks at God and, and, and God's presence in this world, uh, which is just extremely important for understanding the theology and the philosophy of the Baal Shem Tov and the Hasidus in general. So his teaching starts, Uparo he kriv, and Pharaoh came close. Where is this? This is a verse from the beginning of Parsha Bishalach in the book of Exodus. Uh, and this is an amazing, amazing part, uh, one of the most action uh, filled parts right before the Jewish people walk through uh, the, the, uh, the, the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea, uh, right, right before God performs this miracle for them. We hear that really Paro is coming very close to the Jewish people. Paro is uh, running after them, is coming close to them. The Jewish people become very afraid at this point. Um, and very, the really, it's a, it's a very, very scary, scary point. Um, and we're told that Paro is really coming close. Uh, the Jewish people don't know what to do. They reach out to Moshe. It, it's a very, very, uh, scary, scary part. But we also see a verse at this point, uh, from Tehillim. And a lot of the times, what a lot of us don't understand about the Tanakh in general is that the Bible comments actually on itself. So we actually have a verse in the Psalms, in Tehillim, specifically Psalm 4, verse 2, that comments on the section of the Jewish people in their sorrow and their struggle and their nervousness right before leaving, uh, right before uh, the miracle occurs. Obviously, they don't know the miracle was, uh, would occur. Otherwise, they might have not had as much nervousness, of course. Uh, but uh, we see that what happened at this point the psalm says, "Bitzar hirchav tali." In the moment of my narrowness, in the moment of my pain, you have widened me. You have made my situation a little wider, more deep. Uh, and now, this is a very uh, hard to understand line in the psalms. As many lines in the psalms are very understand are hard to understand, but these are the exact psalms that, that people, spiritual masters like the Baal Shem Tov, love to explore and open up for us. And I think the Baal Shem Tov is going to do that in a wonderful way here. So he says, Ki al karev yoter Because by way of things that we struggle with, we come closer to Hashem Yitbarach. We come closer to God. Now, how, how, right? That's obviously a big how. Why? Why do things that we struggle with help us come closer to God? 
But before we just jump right into that subject, we have to understand the beautiful understanding that the Baal Shem Tov is making here is that the, the Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzrayim, uh, Mitzrayim, and that comes from the root Sadiq Resh, which means narrows, probably originally referring to the Nile River, uh, where it would become narrow, uh, and that's where Egypt was located. Um, but of course, the Baal Shem Tov is going to look at this from a spiritual perspective. Mitzrayim, Egypt, in a, a metasymbolic way, is means any place in which is narrow for us, or another word, there are many words that sound familiar to each other, the tsar, which means narrow in, in this context, also means tsar means sorrow in, in uh, English as well, right? Tsar, right? Soros, if is anyone, uh, if you've ever heard anyone say to you, I've got a lot of tsaris, right? Sarot in Hebrew means suffering. And soros, saris in, in Yiddish, uh, would means from the Hebrew is, is also troubles here. So whenever we have troubles or something is troubling us, it is it, it can help us come closer to God. And why would he be saying this here? Uparo he crave. Paro came close, uses the same verb he crave to come close that that uh, of this idea of coming close to God. That in one way, the thing that causes us sorrow as the Jewish people or anybody are suffering, which is metasymbolicized and not just as Egypt, but really is Paro as the force that's bringing that suffering, that the allegory of, of Pharaoh. Um, uh, coming down on the Jewish people. The Baal Shem Tov immediately jumps to what this really is coming closer to God. Although that the suffering is coming closer, we're actually coming closer to God. And it's a really daring uh, move that, that the Baal Shem Tov is making. But, and so how do we do this? How does God clump, come closer to us? V'zehu hirchav tali. And this is what it means by in the Psalms when it says, and you have made me wider. You have grown my heart, right? This is the part, this is how the Baal Shem Tov is going to look at this passage. He basically says at this point that a Jew at this point, when noticing that there is a struggle, when there's something, there's some suffering that that person is experiencing or sees suffering out in the world, what the Baal Shem Tov is asking us and sees as a model in the Jewish people that there really is something lacking within God's presence in the world, that there's something that God's presence is not hitting, right? Not being in contact. And it's up to the Jewish people to fill that lack, to help connect the Shekhinah, God's indwelling presence, to that little piece. As I talked about last time in our last class, we talked about the idea that a human being is the main way in which God connects to different layers of reality in our world, right? God is so infinite and so transcendent that as uh, if God was to actually interact with this world in a physical way, God would no longer be God. Why? Because if God did something, did a physical action, right, then God would, would have changed and been different, from one period to the next, and therefore no longer be God in our definition of God. So therefore, God uses human humanity to cause dwelling of godliness in each space. So what we should be thinking, according to the Baal Shem Tov, is that we should really be trying to help God's presence be in this place, that it's an opportunity to help widen um, God's presence in the world. That's what Hirchab Tali in my sorrows, you have widened me. What should we be widening? According to the Zohar, according to the mystical corpus, Li is code, me is a code for the Shekhinah. Why might you say that? Because again, what is our true essence of uh, as human beings? It's our soul. It's not the body. It's actually our soul. And our soul, as I said before, comes is, is a piece of God from above. So when I say me, right, I mean that piece of God that's inside of me. Right. I have to expand that peace of God inside of me to fill up that place that was that that we were experiencing sorrow from. And by doing this, we unify, as we talked about before, Nase We actually unify these two together. And 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 uh, uh, God's most transcendent presence, which is codenamed Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and God's most imminent presence in our hearts and in our souls, in the Shekhinah, the indwelling divine presence. And what the Baal Shem Tov asks is that we should specifically pray about this, that our prayers shouldn't be when we're suffering, 
man, I really wish this could be better for me. I wish this could be, you know, I wish I could do better at this. I wish I didn't have to suffer this way. But instead, we should change the orientation of our prayers to, I really wish that God's presence can dwell in this situation here. I wish I can, ex I wish I can be a Kaylee. I wish I can be a vessel to expand God's presence in this world and put help God be manifest in this place. I hope that I could be like electric wires that expand godliness in the world. And I am capable of doing that. Every human being is. But we just have to set our intention and our mind to it while we're praying. And therefore, we make our, our prayers less selfish about my you know, imminent suffering at this moment. But instead, we connect our, our own suffering to a bigger vision and a bigger understanding of, of actually, in a deeper sense, God's suffering and the world being without godliness, divinity in each other's lives. We live in a world today that is sometimes feels so distant from godliness. And this is what this teaching is talking about, is we should be praying to expand godliness in the world, to expand the feelings of holiness and transcendence and meaning in life, because that's what matters. And what the Baal Shem Tov ends by saying, Ki tzadikaya inun shlichu de matronita. This is a line from the Zohar that says, The righteous are like the bridesmaids of the Shechina, which is beautiful. And if you picture, I mean, the way I at least picture a bridesmaid in a beautiful wedding, like carrying the, the dress of the bride coming down the aisle. And, and the great Kabbalists and Jewish mystics really thought about God's presence in this world like a beautiful bride walking down the aisle and everyone would stand up as she walked by. And it was this beautiful feeling of grace in the world, just as we feel like when we see a beautiful bride. Um, and what the Kabbalists pictured that the great um, spiritual masters of our tradition, the tzaddikim, the righteous people, were were people who helped the shechina. Right? What do the bridesmaids do? They they pick up the dress so it, it doesn't get caught. The bride the bride doesn't get caught on the dress or uh, anything the bride needs to make sure the bride is is okay at that moment so she can do everything that she needs to do. And so too as tzaddikim, as people who are striving to be righteous, striving to 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 um, be more holy in this world. What we really do is um, we're bridesmaids of the Shekhinah. We're helping God dwell in each moment. We're helping the feminine presence of God dwell in each moment like bridesmaids, which is this beautiful allegory that the Baal Shem Tov is using here. And in that way, we can turn our own suffering into moments when we can expand godliness in the world by connecting our suffering to the suffering and the pain of the Shekhinah, of God's indwelling presence in this world. Let's get to one more teaching. I, I want to end with the Baal Shem Tov with this beautiful teaching because I think it's it's just it's so masterful. Um, there's this teaching in the Gemara in the Talmud that's um, about the the basic prayer in Judaism, which is the Shema, uh, the Jewish declaration of faith. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elkeinu, Hashem Akad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. The Lord is God. The Lord is one. And it says according to our Jewish law that. Although it's it's hard to have kavanah, it's hard to have intention, it's hard to be sincere when praying, especially when reading all the prayers we're supposed to be reading. The the halacha, Jewish law obligates us to really have intention when we at least say the sentence, if not also the vehav to prayer that goes after it, but really the sentence. And what are we supposed to be thinking about this time? We're supposed to be kabbalat ol malchut shamayim. We're supposed to be receiving upon ourselves the yoke of heaven. What does this mean? Good question. Well, you know, obviously this is going to be my opinion, but in general what it means is to receive the kingship of God into our own lives. That right, it, it, it could be true that God can be king out there, but is God truly king for me? Is Do I really believe at that moment? And I have, have I really taken on in my life that God is going to be king, that God is the one in charge? Am I really thinking of that in an intentional way? And that is the spiritual process that actually transfers between saying the Shema, right? Before the Shema, maybe I'm an individual person. I'm lonely. I'm experiencing existential loneliness. I'm, I might be, God might be a theoretical concept or a philosophical idea, but I'm really separate from that concept. But the but after the Shema, the ideal is that we then feel connected to God, that we then feel that God is in charge in our lives, is there and is a presence in our lives and is the presence of our community. So there's a there's a there's a halacha in the in the um in the Gemara that says um never say the Shema twice in a row. And uh 
the, the question you might say, if Shema is such a great prayer, why not say it twice? Why not say it over and over and over again? Well, the fear actually is that um, by saying Shema twice, you might uh, a neighbor might think that, oh, maybe you believe in two gods, right? You're saying Shema for the first god, and then the second Shema is for the second god, right? That's the way the Tal- Talmud is thinking about this. And to not show that we don't, God forbid that we believe in two gods, we say the Shema only once. And there's a halacha here from the Gemara that says in, in the Talmud that says um, very interestingly, um, you know, why would you say two Shmas in the first place, right? The reason you'd want to say two Shmas is maybe the first time you said the Shema, the spiritual process didn't work out. Maybe in, in what, what, what the Baal Shem Tov will call the Machshava Zara, an alien thought came into our head and we didn't really, um, couldn't concentrate in the proper way to have the proper intention uh, when saying the Shema. So therefore, you said, oh, I'm going to just do it again. Let me do it again, and I'll get the prop, do this in the proper way, and the spiritual process will work correctly, and I'll therefore feel different at the at the other end. Uh, makes sense, actually. So if that be the case, then why would the Gemara, why would the Talmud say that this is wrong? Right? Why would the Talmud say this is wrong? Well, the Baal Shem Tov gives a fantastic answer here. He gives a really, really fantastic answer. Oh, look. First of all, it's the Gemara that gives the answer, but it's the Baal Shem Tov that explains it. The Gemara replies to this question, this query, Chavruta Klape Shmaya Maika, which is basically, are you going to treat God just like you treat anybody else where sometimes you don't hear what somebody says? No, you're going to concentrate more when God's in the picture, which of course our response to that might be, really? You really were concentrating every time you daven, right? I, there, you've never been praying and, and not be, and, and been insincere? If you've spent a day in shul before, you've seen that it's pretty hard to keep kavanah and pretty hard to keep one's intention uh, the whole time. Whenever you're, you know, even though God is, is great and amazing and powerful, it's hard to keep it, one's, one's intention and one's sincerity and one's thought on the topic besides, you know, what's for lunch afterwards. So what could the Gemara be meaning here? And from that point, the Baal Shem Tov steps off here in such a wonderful way. He opens this passage up for real people. And what is he saying? At this point, we have to explain what is receiving on oneself the yoke of heaven. He writes, Because a person is obligated to believe. What Jewish belief is for the Baal Shem Tov uh, is that God fills all the worlds, Malo Kola Aretz Kavodo, that God fills all worlds and all spaces. And for me, this was a revolutionary understanding in my belief of God, that God wasn't something like out there or something very, very far away, but no, God was an energy that filled all of life, that is one's capable of being in relationship with all the time, and that God is present in all things. The energy of the universe, which for me felt more like my experience of God. And now I was, for me at least, I was seeing this within within text. And this is the foundation of the Baal Shem Tov's theology, is that God fills up all places, even the places we don't think God was at first. He writes from a, a, a Zoharic expression in the original Aramaic, late atar panui mine, that there was no, there's no space uh, that is absent from him. There's no place in this world in God's creation that is absent from him. And we've talked about before, if you've listened to previous recordings, why this is the case, is because God cre- when God creates differently than man creates. God creates, I'm sorry, man creates, when what, man creates something, let's say you, uh, you know, created a, a park bench or something like that. I was a carpenter. I make the bench, cut down the wood, right? I shape it into the thing. I put it in. And there's the park bench. I could walk away from the park bench, and the park bench still exists, right? The park bench is outside of me. God creates in a different way, according to Jewish mysticism, and certainly according to Baal Shem, the Baal Shem Tov, is that God creates and is still connected to that thing in which God creates. God is constantly, according to the, the, the allegory of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism, God is constantly speaking or bringing that thing into fruition. And if God stopped for one second, that thing would no longer be in existence. The corollary to that and the under, the, what comes out of this according to the Baal Shem Tov is that because God is constantly speaking and bringing that thing into fruition, God can be found in that thing. That if something is in existence, it means that God is there. And for the Baal Shem Tov, that was a foundation of Jewish faith, to believe that God is present in every moment and God is present in everything. 
So, of course, going back to the Shema, all of the thoughts of man, even our weirdest thoughts, our strangest thoughts, right? The things that we think are interrupting our moments and things that are giving us sorrow, God, too, is found at those points. God, too, is found at those points. So by saying, and, and oh, of course the way this gets back to the Shema here, is that if you thought the first time you didn't have intention because you had some alien thought, and therefore God wasn't present in that moment, you are wrong. Because even if you're having an alien thought at that moment, within that alien thought, within that thought that was, at least according to your understanding, foreign, really has God that is within it. And it's just up to us to receive that upon us and to find the godliness within that thought, to uplift that thought and elevate that thought to its original divine origin, because God is connected to that thought as God is connected to all things. Okay? Now, to get back finally, at the end of all this, we get back to suffering and pain and sorrow. Right? It, all of us experience suffering and, and pain. It's, it's, it's not, we don't experience suffering because we're bad people or um, we've done something wrong necessarily. Um, but we all go through periods of ratsua vashu. We go through periods of being close to God, uh, running towards God in the Aramaic, and shuv, and coming back to God, and being dwelling in a place of katnu, or smallness. And it's easy sometimes to do the closeness, right? It feels great when we're on top of the mountain. But what do we do when we're not on top of the mountain? What do we do when we're suffering? What do we do when we feel distance from God? At that moment, Right, if we're lucky, I feel like we feel longing, we feel sorrow, we feel distant, we feel disconnected. And most of us just get sad and, and want to get out of this feeling as much as possible and kind of leave it behind and say, you know, this is not part of my spiritual life. But what's really important to do according to the Baal Shem Tov is that really that longing is part of godliness as well, and that sorrow is part of our godly path as well. And we're supposed to ask the question, like, where is God in this sorrow? Where is God in this pain? I think for me, at least, answering from a personal perspective, I'm, I'm happy that I have pain and suffering when I'm distant from God. Right? I think you can easily live in a way, and God can be, as the Baal Shem Tov would say, Hester, Hester, that God would be very, very hidden from us, hidden in so, such a way that I would even know that, that God, I didn't feel God's presence. Right? Meaning that God can be so hidden from us that I don't even know that God, that I feel that God is hidden from me, right? I, I could not even know and have God on my radar, radar. But the very fact that God's on my radar and I'm feeling that I'm distanced from God means I've already got past step one, right? That I'm, I, that I'm in relationship with God, right? Just because I feel that sorrow at that point and that point that I feel distant from God, uh, just that sorrow alone means that I'm in relationship, right? Well, because one feels heartbroken, at least one knows one is alive and has been in love, right? I always like to say that and like to think about that, right? Yes, heartbrokenness is a terrible, horrible thing. We suffer from it. But what it always means is that we were in love. And this is something we deal with avelut, with, with mourning, when someone loses a loved one. Right? The reason one feels pain is because one was in love at one point. One had a relationship in this world of being close. And a lot of people don't have that. And so we should feel lucky at those points, blessed at that point, that we are in relationship. So we can even use our suffering and our hard times to help us rise closer to God. Why, of course, because God is present in every moment and everything. I hope you've enjoyed learning the Baal Shem Tov with me. Next class, I think on Wednesday, next uh, Facebook Live or podcast, wherever you might be listening to this, um, we're going to uh, move to Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak Cohen and begin to explore some of his amazing teachings as well. And I know they'll be, uh, and I hope as Rabbi Shem with God's help, that they'll be just as inspiring and moving to myself and to you all as well. I'll talk to you soon. Have a great week.